Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Congresswoman Stacy Plaskett. It is Coffee with Stacy. Um, and oh wow, I'm dressed up today, right? This is unusual. This is a little different. But you know, it's that time of the every other year. And so members of Congress are busy from now until November 3rd, you can imagine. But you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Wanted to share with you guys what I've been working on, um, hear what I think some of you are thinking about right now. Thank you all for being here. Thanks uh, for taking time out this morning to have a discussion with us. So, <clears throat> you know, um, I had a chance earlier this week, um, Congress is in session, so I was um, up here in DC and I, Talia, my youngest child um, is doing, they have virtual learning going on right now. Um, but I was able to get her out of class for like an hour um, and take her to the memorial for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one that was just spontaneously created on the steps of the Supreme Court. Um, the amazing messages that people wrote to her and to us about her were just, um, just awe-inspiring. And I'm gonna put some of those up. Um, Japera, remind me to put some of those up on my Facebook page because the messages were just um, incredible. And um, then Congress has been in session. We've been working on a continuing resolution. So a continuing resolution, for those who don't understand, it's called a CR. So this way you know what the talking heads are talking about when they say this. The CR, or continuing resolution, is rather than when we create a whole new budget, <clears throat> we have not agreed on everything within the budget. And so what we do is we, continue, we have a resolution to continue the budget as it was previously. So um, we have now agreed on a continuing resolution of the budget into December. And that will allow us, you know, people don't want to make decisions about the next year's budget because they don't know, um, you know, each side, the Republicans, Democrats don't know who's going to be in charge. And so the Democrats are like, look, we're not going to negotiate on this if we might be able to get the White House and the Senate. That way we are able to do more. Um, and so, no, we're not going to, you know, agree to negotiate at this point when let's just keep it until December um, and see what happens. And in the same way, the Republicans are like, no, we're not going to concede this um, because we may have a stronger Senate. Um, you may have less seats in the House. Um, we may be able to keep the White House. So let's just hold strain until December, keep everything copacetic the way it is, and then we'll take it back up then. So that's what a CR and a continuing resolution is. Um, <clears throat> my office, and shout out to Jeff Noel. Um, many of you don't really see him. He's the behind the scenes guy, behind the curtain, my legislative director, um, Jeff Noel, um, our Massachusetts boy in the office. You know, it seems like I always have someone from Massachusetts in my office. I don't know what that connection is, but I got to figure it out. And um, we were able to really support the airline um, industry this week. Uh, you know, the airlines were had received a specific amount of funding after the coronavirus for the amount of flights that were um, held off, right? You have American Airlines with less than, you know, they've reduced themselves by 70% um, the amount of flights because most of their flights were international. That's not happening. Delta, United, JetBlue, Spirit have all reduced the volume of flights, which in turn means that there's a reduction in the need for personnel. Um, not as much people are buying tickets. And that means that, you know, um, airline workers, um, flight attendants, captains, crew, ground crew, um, maintenance, engineers, all of these people who support the airline industry, <coughs> excuse me, several hundred thousand um, could potentially be furloughed or out of work. And so um, in the last coronavirus bill that was passed, there was funding put in place for them. Um, in the um, 
HEROES Act, which the House passed, we continue to put funding in them, but we've been negotiating back and forth. So on the Senate side, um, same thing saves the airline workers. I don't know if I'd go that far, but on the Senate side, there's a clean bill that supports um, the airlines and the need for them to have funding. It stands alone apart from the rest of the coronavirus bill. And so I was asked by the airline industry and the unions and we decided to step out on a limb and um, myself and Congressman Joyce, my good friend Joyce from um, Ohio, we um, sponsored the legislation on the House side that would provide relief to the airline industry, which would, you know, vitally important to the Virgin Islands, to places that are isolated, need airline support, um, and we'll see what happens with that. So we've been busy at work. <clears throat> you know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, earlier this morning, um, on, on Friday, there was press conference uh, uh, regarding Breonna Taylor. More information is coming out. You know, some of you may know that I was a prosecutor at one point, um, and they were having discussions about the grand jury. The grand jury is run completely by the prosecutor. Defense attorneys do not have any right to be in the grand jury unless their own defense, the defendant is in there um, testifying. Um, and sometimes cases not even. Um, so they control what the grand jury hears, they control what information is presented, um, and it's secret, right? Um, there's someone taking notes, there are stenographers, but it's not open to the public. Uh, and so there are questions about what is the information that the attorney general decided to put into the grand jury? Was uh, the information, the testimony of the uh, Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, her, um, who was in the apartment with her, who says the police did not um, identify themselves. The other witnesses who said the police did not identify herself, um, identify themselves. Where is that testimony given? Additionally, why was there a, rec uh, a wanton um, endangerment only of the white uh, apartment dweller and not another black family that had um, bullets shot into their home? Um, why was none presented uh, wanton um, for Breonna Taylor? Why did the police uh, tell the ambulance to leave in a situation that they knew could have been fatal, not only to um, bystanders or to the people that they were trying to arrest, but to themselves? What was that about? So they're now calling for um, the transcript to be released. That has been done in the past and we'll see where it goes from there. But today I've got some amazing guests. Um, you know, I thought a couple of weeks ago we did one with some uh, a basketball player who was going to play professionally in Italy, <clears throat> as well as an Air Force Academy graduate who was working to become a pilot of these massive aircrafts. And so today we decided to do part two um, and we have two amazing women who are going to be part of our discussion today. And are they coming up? Do we have them here? Great. We have with us Aaliyah Boston, who is a collegiate basketball player, and Jelaine Jones, who is an activist and community organizer. So um, let me introduce them to you. <clears throat> Jalen Jones, um, ladies, I'm gonna go um, age order here. <laughs> Jalen is, um, is an ancestral Virgin Islander. Um, it's so funny, Jalen, I use that term with my husband, he can't stand when I say that. Um, because he's like, how do you get away with saying you're an ancestral native Virgin Islander and you're born in Brooklyn? I'm like, dude, it is what it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she's currently working, um, doing, um, she's a mixologist, um, a bartender, and running her own business called Mind Your Business Cleaning. Um, she organized um, a movement and individuals on St. John in conjunction with organizers on St. Thomas and St. Croix to stand in solidarity um, concerning systemic racism, um, issues of continental uh, United States uh, systemic racism against black people, 
uh, people of color, um, our own issues in the Virgin Islands as well. Um, so we're gonna ask her to highlight some of those issues, particularly that of colonialism and the issues that many St. Jonians are um, having really amazing and, and really thoughtful discussions about today. And then we also have Aaliyah Boston. <clears throat> Aaliyah is a sophomore, um, she's from St. Thomas, um, went to Worcester Academy before going to South Carolina, where she is now the rookie, was the rookie of the year. Um, and I'm just so excited to have her. She is raised in St. Thomas and she and her sister decided to go to a um, live with their aunt um, so that they could pursue their basketball dream. And there's just that right now. And so she is, um, Leah, you're considered a Gamecock, right? Yes. That's, that's what you guys are at South Carolina, um, where she has, let, let's just look, listen to some of these stats. Okay. She um, dominated um, as a Gamecock um, when they went on to their 32-1 season, including a perfect 16-0 record in the SEC. And ranked as the number one team in the country. Um, she averaged 12 and 12.5 points, 9.4 rebounds per game. Um, she became the program's first national freshman of the year, winning the award unanimously to cap a postseason that saw her collect the Lisa, Le Lisa Leslie Center of the Year Award, second team All-American Honors, and SEC Freshman Defense Player of the Year recognition. So, Ladies, glad to have you, glad to have you guys. Um, Virgin Islanders doing big things, big things in the world. Um, and this is, you know, it's so interesting because we talk about really serious topics and I know you guys are working really hard, but you don't know how much life you give other Virgin Islanders to know, um, you know, we claim you guys as our own um, we actually boast about you guys like you are uh, our children. Uh, you would think that your parents didn't have you, that one of us <laughs> have you guys when we're out in the street. Um, so, <clears throat> Aaliyah, talk, tell me about what you're doing right now. You know, what's happening with basketball season? How are you practicing? Where are you? So, I'm at the University of South Carolina right now. And we have workouts. We work out during the week and we lift weights as usual. And the practices were a little different at first because of all the rules. Um, but Are you like a pod? Is that, you know, have you guys created some kind of like- Or like a bubble? A bubble, yes. I don't think we've done that yet. I don't know how, if that's gonna happen, but mm -hmm. we're just waiting to see. But yeah, we're just working out and still have classes. How many classes are you taking? What's your major? I believe I'm taking five classes and I'm majoring in mass communications. What 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 do you want to do with the mass communications? Um, I really want to be on like a, a broadcaster for um, games um, for sports basketball. And I, I don't know, I'm just really interested in it. And because people always say it's like, basketball. I, that's what I want to stay involved with the game. So, okay. yeah. When did you know you wanted to play basketball? Like, how old were you? When you're like, this is this is me. I was nine mm -hmm. when I started, and I really started started because my sister played, and I wanted to to do that. So I started at nine, and I, I from then it was like that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. How was it um, going um, at to go just making the decision to go away to school um, for middle school or, you know, high school. What was that it, like? Honestly, I didn't know what was really happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> initially, Alexis and I um, came up to the States for like an AU type of thing to find a team where we could travel with and just get exposure from that. But then the team we were playing with at first, when we lived like eight minutes away from my aunt's house, and then my mom was all like, do you guys want to stay and and just go to school up there? And I was like, sure, like, why not? Like, I was I was 12. Like, it really wasn't registering that I was, like, not going back home initially. But, yeah. 
So, um, Aaliyah, how tall are you? Six, four and three quarters. Oh, ah, so I wanted my daughter, Talia, to see you. Got a big friend down because Talia is probably one of the tallest people in her class. I'm six feet. Her dad is six, six. And so we assume she's going to be pretty tall as well. Yes. She is an amazing basketball player. And I just wanted you to see her. Yes, tall women rock. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, you know, it's interesting because Worcester is a school that I played against in high school. Really? Uh, yeah, I went to boarding school in Connecticut. And oh, so wow. we played against Worcester. And I ran track and field, but we played against them in other sports. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, at 13, um, you know, it's weird make, how these decisions are made. My mom saw and um, in the New York Times this article about this group called A Better Chance that gives scholarships for students. You know, people have heard of A Better Chance. They send black students to private schools. Um, and so she thought I would go to a school in New York City, a high school there. And so I took this exam and we started getting these calls from these schools in Massachusetts and Connecticut or whatever. And, um, you know, they offered full ride, pretty much a full ride for me to go to boarding school. And I'm an only child and my parents were kind of like, oh, we don't want our baby away from us. And my parents a long time, they, you know, they were married for many years before they had me. But when they saw the facilities, you know, I, I mean, my high school was 400 acres. There's a building for every subject, um, you know, dormitories and kids from all over the world in every state. They were like, we got to give you this opportunity. Um, so I always, you know, give a shout out to young people who are willing to take risk to step outside the box and do something different. And Jelaine, that's what you've been doing, um, really putting yourself out there and really um, stepping up and making us think hard about things that we have not been thinking about previously or not thinking about it in the ways that you are forcing many of us as Virgin Islanders to think about them. So where are you right now? Cause you look cold. I am cold. Um, I am, so you know how the island uh, shuts down for two months, you know, off season and mm -hmm. uh, since mo my, job and my business is around tourism we're off so my boyfriend and I he's decided to come and see his family and then we decided we're going to drive through the sticks to go and see Yellowstone because it's always been on my, it's always been on my bucket list it's been the thing well you know if you're young um why not right yes I do believe in traveling do it yeah, um, oh, although traveling during a pandemic is probably not great. However, we did, it was his mom's 60th and they really wanted to see him and whatnot. And we isolated and uh, took a test and whatnot. But when we came up, we were trying to be as cautious as we could during this Very time. Good. But um, we, I am definitely taking advantage of being up here. <laughs> so Jalen, tell, tell us what you're doing on St. John right now. What are the discussions you're having with so we, I mean, because it's, it's, it is definitely a group of us that kind of have discussions with each other and have been for a while. But so Dr. Hadia Sewer and like Kurt Marsh and I, we kind of like talk about, um, you know, the, the colonialism and, you know, do we, do we want to be, do we want to move away from like um, dependency on America and also just how, we need there's a need to reclaim our space as Virgin Islanders because I feel like there is definitely an identity crisis going on, um, as in like are we Virgin Islanders? Are we Americans? Are we both? Are we not? You know, like and where do we want to be and how do we get there? You know, um, even our relationship with other Caribbean islands, right? Right. What is that? So. <laughs> It's uh, so I remember being younger and going down island and walking through customs and them looking at our passports and being like, oh, you're from the Virgin Islands, hmm. you know, um, and like, you know, like where I remember them saying, like, you have no culture. And 
I remember being like, what are you talking about? You know, mm-hmm. like, I think I was like nine or 10, you know, around that, that age. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember being like, what are you talking about? And then, and then being an adult and going to these islands again, I was, yeah, you're right. We, we've lost that part of ourselves. And that's where the identity crisis comes from when you don't even, I don't know, it's kind of, it's just a, it's just a weird thing to think about when you're an ancestral and you don't feel comfortable in your home. It's like when you want to be home, but then you realize that you are home. So we, uh, and also, like, I am, I be for this morning. Let me drink my coffee a little bit. Say that again. You, you, when you no, want to be home, it's like, yeah, you have the feeling of like, I just want to go home, but I am home, you hmm. know? Hmm. So, you're um, physically home, but are I'm you really physically home? home? But am I really home? And, you know, Leah, um, what do you think of that one? Um, I mean, that's that's something to think think about because I mean I get what what you're saying about that like you want it you want to like you're you want to go home but you're already there you, mm-hmm. yeah you, you feel uncomfortable in your own space it's my it's so and Saint John the reason that so uh, when we did the, the the Black Lives Matter movement um, like you were saying like I was uh, like you were saying it was to stand in solidarity with our brethren in the states and what they were going through but we don't really have police brutality back home like they are my mom was a you know on the force for 30 years and my uncle was and my cousin is and this cousin you know like they're our family back home however we do have our own issues gun violence like saint thomas highlighted gun violence in their movement you know and i like we highlighted colonialism in our movement in saint john because that is such a real thing i am a bartender and in a very white space in um in coral bay st john right and i met my brother i spoke to my brother a couple weeks ago and he hasn't been home in a while but when he came home last year he said to me it's amazing when you're walking through cruise bay or coral bay and people are looking at you like at, at him like they're like he doesn't belong there and that's something that, and that's what I'm talking about. Like you're, you want to be home, but you're not, and you are physically, but you don't mm-hmm. feel welcome, but yet it is your home. Mm. So um, it's, it's funny because um, I think a lot of it is the intentionality, you know, mm-hmm. um, I feel, and, and um, I'm going to put somebody's name out there. Um, Darwin Newton, who is, um, Darwin, if you're listening, I'm calling you out. Um, lives in Atlanta. His mom is from St. Croix. His dad is from St. John. He went to high school on St. Thomas. He is a Virgin Islander, you know, like uh, in the greatest sense of the word. And I see he and his wife, who's also a Virgin Islander, are very intentional um, about. <laughs> I'm sorry, they are very intentional about how they raise their children in the States um, and reminding them of their culture and who they are. Mm-hmm. And I feel like having grown up in New York to Virgin Island parents, that that was really pushed, maybe overemphasized because you were away from home, right? right and so right, there right. was this need to um, I, I know so much Virgin Island history um, and more in comparison to many of my contemporaries, um, you know, cook all of the food, um, you know, know all of the, many of the customs and their roots and the ones that we think are our customs that are really not our customs mm-hmm. that have been added. Um, you know, I won't even go into Madras. That's a uh, you know hyper um, sensitive issue for many people. But you know that is not an original Virgin Islands um, where that was adapted over time from individuals who've been brought in. But you know, hey, um, <laughs> but <laughs> things that you know you you're made aware of, um, right? 
And Aaliyah, you know, what you're living in Massachusetts, right? You were living in Massachusetts and now you're in South Carolina. Was there um, a, um, intentional reminders for you that you were a Virgin Islander? Yeah, I would say that like when we left at 12, like that's a really early age. And I think it's because I no longer have my accent and like I can't get it back, but my sister still has hers. Like, it's like, that. Exactly, like she never left. And so I just think that's really funny, but I never really lost touch. I would say that um, St. Thomas, my aunt, she, she always emphasized it and she would cook meals like my grandma, my mom would. And mm -hmm. I mean, it was always like home was there, regardless mm -hmm. of being in Massachusetts or not. And I always, we always tried to go home, like when we had the chance, maybe like once every summer, we might mm -hmm. be able to get to go home, but yeah. Um, Jayla, Jelaine, what would be some things that you think we could do that would um, support this, this notion, you know? Um, like uh, on St. Croix, we, uh, you know, have D. Hamilton and Jackson Day, right? Yes, yes. Um, to talk about free press and the struggle for, in, you know, independence and free thought and the work of Virgin Islanders in that area. But I always think that the fact that we have the day off from school is a bad thing. Because then we don't, the children do not uh, utilize that time mm -hmm. to really spend um, entrenched in that. <clears throat> like it's always been my thought that what we should do is rather than have the day off, that uh, at least on St. Croix, the children should be bused to Grove where the celebration is. Okay. Right? and that they be made a part of that activity um, rather than sleep in. I can agree with that. If they have parents who bring it up, there are some parents who may take them. Many may not have the resources to do that. Some parents may have to work because they're in the private sector, they're not government employees, or maybe they go to the beach for the day. But even if we made it a half day at school where they are at Grove and see the celebration and hear the speeches and understand the importance that that would put it in their mind in a different kind of way. Um, yes, I do agree with that. Um, when I was uh, when I was in New Jersey, we had a day called Multicultural Day, and rather than uh, rather than staying home, we just kind of celebrated everyone else's culture. And I feel like that, Columbus, that what used to be Columbus Day now Indigenous Peoples Day or a different one? Um, so no, it was it was just a, I think it was just a random day that the school selected, to be honest with you. However, that like that uh just so that's I agree with that because we were definitely rather than just being home and celebrating our cultures at home, we were <laughs> at school with each other, like, hey, that's your culture, that's really cool. We learn all about you know, you have informational boots and boots with food and whatnot, and like, you know, so that was yeah, the immersion is necessary. Um what I like we've had discussions about um reintroducing the culture on St. John. Um, because like Aaliyah was saying, when you're away from, or like you were saying, when you're away from home, you are able, like, you know, you, I think you're more aware of your culture, you know, um, versus when you're there and, you know, you're not, when I was a kid, we were doing, uh, woodworking and we would, um, in summer camp, we'd learn how to make tots and, you know, Johnny cake and pate, you know, like we were, but, I'm sorry. Are you a good tart maker? <laughs> not, a, not according to my grandmother. She said I'll get there though. <laughs> Aaliyah, do you do any cooking? I, I, I do I actually. Cook. Oh, sorry. Oh, Aaliyah says she can cook. I can cook. Go ahead, Aaliyah. I believe you. <laughs> What's your best dish, Aaliyah? What's my best dish? I really like steak, like baking steak. And any mm -hmm. summer, fine, but I like lo I love steak. Okay. Local, any local dishes? Local dishes. I mean, I can supervise that part. 
Nicely done. Nicely done. I can supervise that part. <laughs> I, I'm not ashamed. I, I love it. I'm not ashamed. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes out of necessity. You you you'll get it down. You know, my sons they they didn't in, immediately, but they're pretty good at local dishes now because I wasn't around to do it for them. And yeah, when you're craving, that's how I got like I, I can do a mean boiled fish because I was craving. When you're like, and then also that's another issue that we have back home as well. We need more. Um, it's hard to find, on St. John especially, it's hard to find a local spot to eat some local food. Like, I don't want conch and butter sauce. I want some pear on the side. I want some selfish, you know? And so you have to do it yourself because there's no one around anymore that's making our food. And I don't, excuse me, but I don't want a cheeseburger every day. Like, that's just not life. You see how Japera is calling me out? The office of Stacey E. Plaston. Yeah. <laughs> you can turn from G. Listen. Listen. I, I can do, I fry fish, I um, make kalaloo, um, red pea soup. Oh. Um, I even make a dish that most people don't even make anymore called mafe. Um, mostly on St. Croix that you hear of mafe. Okay. Um, I don't know that at all. all of it, but turning fungi, I, I love fungi, but. I never got it. No. I never got it. I'm, yeah, my mom can make a mean fungi boy with some breadfruit on the side. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Listen, my mom is the whole like the 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 plop the fungi in the bowl and turn it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I've tried it so many times, and mine like just breaks apart every time. Um, yeah. Mom, we're gonna have a class. <laughs> we're gonna have. A class. <laughs> So, Jalen, where do you see your movement going um, in the next, you know, one um, week to normal or even during this virtual? I honestly, um, at this moment in time, I think that the pandemic kind of like slowed our role, but also because I feel like, uh, I mean, well, anyway, physically, but virtually, um, Oh yeah, we've been on it virtually, I feel like. We have been, um, I think we just kind of need to change change the the um, the tourism narrative. Um, it is, you know, like this is not just America's paradise or America's playgrounds. You know, this is the Virgin Islands. Like, yes, we are owned by America, which I hate that term, but we need to, you know, there's it's it's not tourism if there's no room for the the locals. You know, um, and cultural I, I, tourism, right? Like we need to, because I mean, when, when you look at it, when you look at the the tourism advertisements for St. Lucia, what do you see? You see St. Lucia. When you look at our tourism videos, I'm looking at Susie from Alabama, and I'm sorry, I don't want to see her. I want to see Miss Smith from down the road making pate or you know frying up some Johnny cake or something. But is that the market we're going for? I think that we need to because, at, at, I mean, we're being, we are literally being pushed out. We are, and we're allowing it to happen. We so have it to. It can't just be us that are coming, right? I'm, so, I'm sorry? It, it can't just be us that are coming, oh, right? No, no, of course not. Of course not, no. Um, can we eventually move to a... Uh, we have an, a tourism-based economy right now, right? Mm -hmm. And that sustains the whole idea of neocolonialism mm -hmm. when, you, when you're dependent on the mother country for help, right? So if, as, so if we, like for instance, look at our COVID situation back home, we, were not, we couldn't stay closed as long as we would like to fight because financially our economy could not sustain itself mm -hmm. without the tourism. But then you let in the tourists and our COVID numbers skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. And then we had to shut down again. And then we're open again. And I see us shutting down another time, to be honest with you. And what does that do? I mean, how does that help? Because I mean, you're killing the same people that are fueling your economy that we need to sustain, right? So how can we move away from being 80% 80 
dependent on tourism? Like, what can we do to sustain ourselves as Virgin Islanders? Because the BBIs were closed until September 1st. And Later. I'm sorry? Later. Oh, yeah, was it? Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought somebody such as said they came back from Anagata. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but, but yes. Tourism, you know. Right, but, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's, that's, that's the only, that's, those are the thoughts that I have. Like, you know, can we, I mean, we have 80% National Park on St. John, right. right? And let's be real, most of that land was stolen, but that's another topic for another day. But how can we, like, towards legal, legalizing marijuana, we're moving towards there. We're not there yet. But I mean, if, you, if we legalized it, could we not start a farm like they do in, Colo you know, in California? Mm -hmm. Like I've been to one of those farms where you like you get paid money. It's hard work, but you get paid some real good money from, you know, from collecting those buds. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a total market that we can move. That's a market we can move into. You know, like there are so many other things. I mean, our healthcare system needs help. Like we have so many other things that to be focusing on tourism. Like that's, well, that's, that's, that's just where I'm at. Yeah, when I came home um, around 2004. It was because we had a large um, sector that was knowledge-based. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot through the EDC program at the time, there were a lot of venture capital, private equity, um, software, um, those type of companies that needed um, people who were, they needed um, maybe not even in their job, but law firms needed more lawyers they yeah. were building homes so we right. need more architects engineers and so you know when i came home i came home with a large group of people in my age group who were also coming home at that time because there was work for them right. um and so you know we had our families here doing that kind of work i mean congress changed the laws um around that same time that made it untenable for those businesses to be in the Virgin Islands. And that was really just a backlash from places like Connecticut and New York, who saw those companies leave there and their tax base, you know, they were missing the funds that those companies right. gave them. Um, so, you know, those are the kinds of things, knowledge-based companies, um, software developers, we have tremendous amount of broadband that would allow us to expand that, you know, being, um, you know, I always say that the Virgin Islands could be, you know, how you hear how in the, in the late summer, all the professional black people go to Martha's Vineyard. Um, why wouldn't all the, you know, those professionals wanna come to the Virgin Islands for Christmas, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and they have their second, third, fourth homes um, there and that be the spot where that amount of wealth and you know and when they're there they're not just hanging out they're um, having discussions they're you know having um, concerts and other kinds of things as well um, but you know um, that would be when Aaliyah would you know as a sports broadcaster after having been in the Olympics and having been in the WNBA would you know lead the charge towards having that come about? Aaliyah, you, is, is, did I say that right? Of course. Olympics, WNBA, then broadcasting, right? Yeah, you got it right. Hey, <laughs> what, um, can you tell me in terms of Aaliyah? Is the is the um. Is is it to I just do your practicing now and nothing else? I didn't I didn't hear the first part. Um, so you know, you guys are just practicing. Is that frustrating? Um, do you miss not being in games now? No, I mean, as of right now, this we probably with even if Corona wasn't a thing, we probably still would just be working out because our season doesn't start till later, but. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm happy with working out. At least we get to do something. It's not like we're not allowed to to play. So I'm really excited though. And they're starting to talk more about our season, like every day. So I'm um, do you find um, you know 
when you're, how's the social distancing going at your school? Just, oh. Are you in a room? Are you in a dorm? Do you have other people with you? Yeah, so we live in an apartment complex setup type. Um, it's like we room with our roommates, but there are also other people in in the complex. Mm -hmm. So there are masks, like when we're leaving our room, in case Is we're in Is there with you? I'm sorry? Is your sister there as yeah. well with you? Yes, she's here too. So we wear a mask in the like hallways and um, is, that, is that good having your sister at the same college with you? Yes. For real. For real. Yeah. No, for seriously. Real. For real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always have someone to talk to. Uh, you're the younger sister also, right? Yes. Now, would she say the same thing? I hope so. She better. <laughs> she better say yeah, how far, now, how far apart are you guys? You guys are pretty close to date. Two and a half years. Two and a half years? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty close. Um, my first three sons are all 25 months apart from each other. And <clears throat> in high school, they all followed each other. Um, but they don't live anywhere near each other now. But I understand that they text each other constantly. I'm not part of the text group, but you know, I'm a little salty about that. Um, but I'm sure I don't necessarily want to even hear what they're texting about um, most of the time. Um, so tell us about what you think the next year is going to be, you know, once COVID, once we have a solution to how we're operating. Um, I'm, I'm just, I don't really have anything. I have really no ideas. I can't even begin to guess like where, how it's going to go. So I'm just, I just pray about it and I just wait to see what people say. Cause I can't stress. I can't do any, anything like that though. Right. Yeah. You can't stress it. You just follow the science, listen to the medical experts, do what they say. That's exactly what I, that's it right there. So, um, listen, I have this thing called favorites, right? And this is um, where I ask you guys to share either some interesting movies that you've been watching that you think people should watch or um, books that you've read that you think people should be reading? Hmm. Um, I don't, I haven't read too many books, but my favorite book, people have probably already read it, but The Hate You Give, like that was a really good book. Really? Oh, you read the book? Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, I didn't know that was a book. Yeah, hmm. I read That's the book, amazing. it was really good. Yeah. Okay. What did it follow? Did it track the movie? Yeah, it, it was it was pretty pretty close. I think mm -hmm. it was like the different parts, but it was it was really good. Okay. Okay. Um, and any movies? Um, I'm more of a TV show type of. Okay. So what's your TV show? So if you on Netflix, I literally recommend The Blacklist. Yeah. Like okay. the best show. Yeah. All right, The Blacklist. The Blacklist, so good. All right, Jelaine, you, I, you know. um, right now I am really stuck on a couple series that have been going through in terms of uh, books. And I have uh, J.D. Robb in that series. So it's a murder mystery drama kind of series. And she has, I mean, it's uh, Nora Roberts pen, uh, what's it called when they have another name? It's pen name, I believe, or? Anyway, but it's Nora Roberts, but she uses the, the moniker J.D. Robb, and it's in death and she, a series, and it's uh, something crazy, like 50-something books, and I'm only on 26. I've just been kind of blowing through it. It's really good. Super funny. Um, and then the other series is um, by Janet Ivanovich, and mm -hmm. it's... Um, so it starts out with One for the Money, which well, there was a movie. It was a really bad movie, but there was a movie years ago for it. Um, and right now I'm on like 26 and it's some weird name, It's all, but it's hilarious. Um, but that's where I'm at. And I'm not really a huge TV fan. Like I'll watch movies, but right now I am kind of addicted to Ratchet, like Nice yeah. Ratchet on Netflix. Is it good? Uh, it's dark, man. <laughs> it's, it's on my like recommended and I just don't know if I should watch it. 
<laughs> I think my roommate's watching it. And it she was is, telling me it's good, but I don't It is so good. Like it doesn't make sense why it's so good because it's also like you have moments where you're like, oof. And it's um <laughs> you're like, ooh, and it's gory. Like it and it's the same trick from um what does she do? She does um the American horror story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I believe it's the same lady anyway. It looks like her. But that's another series that's really good. Um, American Horror Story. So clearly I like really morbid things. <laughs> Just listening to the more to you know about Jelaine, <laughs> the more you love. <laughs> well, um, I have been um, I actually the two books that I've been reading were books that were recommended by um, one of my sons, Ariel. Um, Ariel is a big sci-fi kind of guy. Um, <clears throat> and he's very spiritual. Um, and the first book is called The Black Hebrew Awakening. Mm-hmm. And it's the final 400 years as slaves in America. And it really correlates um, the African experience of slavery um, in a biblical sense. Um, and 400 years as the 400 years of silence between the Old and New Testament, the 400 years um, of the children, the Hebrews um, in the biblical times. Very interesting. Um, Not a book that I would have picked up on my own. And then the other one is a really strange series called by Joe Abercrombie, and it's called Little Hatred. It's um, kind of like a mix of medieval, gunslinger, magic, um, just just kind of bizarre. But that's a little kind of like how he is. Um, but it's it's been really good. Yeah. And um, I have been watching a bit. Um, Jonathan and I are have have been watching Lovecraft Country. Um, by by Jordan Peele. Okay. It's on HBO. Okay. Um, Jelaine, you love gore, and it's all that. Um, it is takes place in the 1940s um, in the South, Black Americans, but there's a lot of kind of occult stuff in there, and it injects history, but injects modern day stuff. So, you know, at one point someone's driving, you know, a 1940s car and they're going to see somebody and Rihanna's "Mm, gotta have my money is playing um, as they're going. So, you know, really kind of of strange. And I started to try and watch, um, I loved back in the day Girlfriends, um, the series. And when I heard it was on Netflix, I said I was gonna watch it and I can't do it because the 1990s acting is so poor. It is. Um, in it that it was kind of painful to watch, which was really disappointing. So I'm going to flip. It had eight series, eight seasons. So I'm going to go maybe to season six when they got a little better at it, maybe. And <laughs> that'll that'll make it bearable. Um, what Joan and Tony are the worst friends. Yeah, yeah they're not good friends. They're not good. She was. They're not good friends. She was pretty bad. <laughs> Okay, so um, the wrap up, I want to let people know who are listening, two things. Census, we have until October 15th to have the census done. Call 340-718-2020, 340-718-2020. If we do not get the numbers right, we will lose money. We will lose resources in the Virgin Islands. This is not about people trying to get in your business. This is about taking care of the Virgin Islands, of our schools, of our um, school lunch programs, of our federal funding. You want your roads fixed. We need to have these numbers right. Um, You want better services. You gotta have the numbers right. So please, if you have not, someone not come to you, please call the census office at 340-718-2020. And with all that is happening in the world, please, I know you registered to vote. Do not come and talk to me if you are not registered to vote. The deadline is October 3rd. I don't wanna hear, oh, they're all the same. 
oh, it doesn't matter. Yes, it matters. We have gone into a runoff gubernatorial election for three votes. Three votes. Your vote counts. It means something. It matters. Please vote. Please register to vote. You see that what the president can do. Um, he appoints the Supreme Court. If you're not living in the Virgin Islands, please understand presidential elections matter. Who is in the Senate matters. The individuals at your state legislature matter. They're the ones who draw the lines as to what the congressional seats are. They are the ones determining um, at the attorney general level, if someone is going to a grand jury, if police are going to be sent to a grand jury or not. It's if you vote. And if you don't vote, you don't have a say. Everybody grow up and vote. This is serious business. I want my sons to live a decent life. I want my daughter to have opportunities. You just saw these amazing Virgin Islanders. They need us to protect them. And one of the best ways to protect them is when we vote. You don't love them if you don't vote. I, I, I'm standing by that one. So that's my rant for the day. <laughs> I will rant again tomorrow and the next day and the next day until November 3rd. Okay. But thank you to these beautiful women. Leah, you know, I, um, your dad made me a drink and a plate of food when I went to his place um, in Yacht Haven. Um, tell him to keep up the good work. Um, We're praying for his continued success and the success of your family and you. Please stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. Um, Jelaine, please continue your work, continue these difficult and important conversations. Please be safe out there in that Wyoming. Girl. If you need Auntie Stacy to come out there and fix somebody, you know how to get in touch with me. You give me a call. Girl, it's been um, interesting. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. Trump 2020s everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> All right. Well, ladies, thank you so much. Thank um, you. Thank you. Guys, everybody take care. God bless. God bless.